The story kicks off in a cave where light shines through from the outside, setting the stage for the tale of a demon king, one of the 72 demons tasked with bringing destruction to the human world. The place is littered with human bodies, and only those who manage to get past the great demon can earn that title. Each demon king is granted incredible powers by the supreme demon king Azria. Inside, two figures appear, seemingly deep in conversation. A man is lounging on a sofa while a woman stands beside him. The man remarks that he's not exempt from anything, glancing at his hand and studying it closely. As he looks down, he mutters the name Lilith. The woman, named Lilith, responds as soon as she hears the demon king call her name. The demon king is deep in thought, pondering her beauty, and asks her what power has been bestowed upon her. Lilith places her hand on her chest, bows slightly, and replies to Demon King Karos that it's gotcha. The Demon King repeatedly said that it was a gotcha. He seemed upset with his power because it didn't make sense if the Demon King's power became a gotcha for him, because it wasn't great and couldn't control all elements. He whined and made a fuss about his power because it didn't provide unlimited knowledge. The woman calmed him down because the great Demon King listened. However, the Demon King kept grumbling and said that he couldn't imagine if he had descended before humans as the Demon King, but his power only gotcha him, then imagined things like when a hero faced him where the place was chaotic with erupting volcanoes spewing falling rocks and the ground almost collapsing. A man with a dark aura was flying through the sky, staring down at another guy who was holding a sword meant for the Demon King. It would be pretty embarrassing if his powers were just a gotcha, right? He imagined himself attacking his opponent, and the hero would probably laugh at him for having such a weak ability. After daydreaming, he turned to Lilith and asked if she could help him change his powers. He was really hoping for a transformation, but his secretary apologized instead. Lilith pictured the face of the great demon king and explained that the powers granted by him couldn't be altered or removed. The guy still didn't want to budge and asked about adding another power, to which Lilith replied that it wasn't possible yet. It's impossible for the latter to say that it's too much for her. He whines to Lilith and doubts herself about how he could conquer the world with Gacha. He doesn't know if Gacha is a power or just luck. When the latter keeps complaining to her secretary, she kindly reminds her that she should refrain from bad-mouthing the great demon king. The latter responds that she has plenty of reasons to complain. She then imagines the face of the great demon, and Lilith tells her that the great demon king told her that if he badmouths the great king again, she will be eliminated because the protagonist starts to tremble and stop talking. Even though scared, the latter continues to protest that other demon kings have received normal abilities for her. So why is he the only one who received the power of Gacha? Lilith responded by saying that it was because the great demon king had become addicted to a game from another human world. It was a game that involved the protagonist possibly slapping his head and stroking it as if he heard the woman write, his secretary. She continued to explain that there were rumors that the great demon king had managed to rank first thanks to his cunning skills. The overall server ranking of the great demon king showed that he ranked first in the game. Karoz looked unsatisfied and seemed uninterested in what she heard from her secretary, so her secretary held her shoulders and patted her to persuade her that ranking first was something to celebrate. He thought it was absurd as she gave up and stated that she should at least try using her powers. Her secretary supported her decision, and she would soon take action on the Demon King's feet. A yellow air circulation came through his feet as the yellow air evolved. There were some boxes with many dots inside them, the last one asking if that was his power when a large box appeared on his face. His secretary instructed him to open the box, and the big demon agreed, saying okay. He mentioned wanting to create some magical abilities, or maybe even have a dragon pop out. Instead, something small and green with a face emerged, freezing the stairs. He saw the creature lying on the demon king's head, and his secretary was shocked, urging him to open another box. As they continued, they found the same creature but in various colors, happily sticking to him. Now he had a total of five little creatures on him, which made him pretty annoyed with the whole situation. Lilith reminded him that there was still one random box left, 
and it seemed like the only remaining box contained something powerful inside. A yellow glow surrounded the box, which the protagonist opened, curious about what would emerge. He placed his finger on it and was taken aback by what he saw. A woman sleeping inside, enveloped in a purple aura. The demon king approached Lilith, shaking her vigorously in anger over what was found in the box. He pointed out that it was just a young succubus who hadn't even gone through her coming-of-age ceremony and lacked any real power, despite being shaken by her master. He congratulated her for not being a slime anymore. The protagonist grew more anxious and told Lilith that he didn't work hard at the academy for this outcome, expressing his frustration about his own power. Lilith replied that since it was already decided, there was no way to change it. He then stormed out angrily, but his secretary was stopped by the demon king because the latter said there was a way and smiled at her. The secretary was surprised and taken aback when she saw her master's smile. When the demon king walked, he said demons are creatures that constantly struggle. The latter continued and pushed himself to always strive to become stronger. As the latter walked, he ordered Lilith to open the gates. He was determined to face the great demon king alone. As they journeyed, the outside was filled with thunder, and the dark red color indicated that the place was full of deathly darkness and shadows of three. People were inside when they arrived in front of the demon queen Astria's office. When Karos and Lilith walked down the hallway, the protagonist was startled by a purple object that exploded. He turned around and was surprised, so he cursed a woman threw a purple object at him and muttered that they finally met. He stood firm while his powers were unleashed, looking angry at the stairs. The latter did not expect that they should not meet, and then shouted that they should not do it in the Grand Castle. The demon king and the woman with the purple object were preparing to attack the stairs at the same time, and he shouted at the stairs to shut up. She seemed to be holding a grudge against the protagonist because she said that with what the stairs did, even turning into dust wouldn't be enough. The stairs felt that the restless woman couldn't be stopped, and he found it annoying. The angry woman unleashed her power in both hands, the last one telling the woman that her emotions were the same as the demon king inside the castle, scared and screaming. As the demon king fought, the woman screamed and said that the stairs had to die. She unleashed her power into the ground and made the stones overflow. The stairs were dragged by Lilith and said it was dangerous. The angry woman kept unleashing her power and screaming that she would fry the protagonist. Someone grabbed a chair, and I threw the chair to make it withstand the woman's attack, making her even angrier. The last secretary faced the angry woman and calmed her down because the place was sacred where they were waiting to meet the great demon king. However, the angry woman couldn't be stopped and insisted on killing the demon king, and everything would be settled automatically. She ordered Lilith to step aside and attacked her with a purple object right where Lilith's body was. Lilith was hit by the attack of the angry woman, causing her to splutter and cough up blood. She fell and hit the wall. The last one who saw the situation muttered Lilith's name. Lilith declared that she was the secretary who served the demon king. Karos, as she stood up and placed the first one on her chest. She was angry and continued that if her lord was hurt, then the reason for her existence would be lost. So she had to protect her lord for the rest of her life. The angry woman simply smiled and said that was how it was, releasing her power and declaring she would wipe them out together. The demon king watched as the two women unleashed their strength, interrupting and mentioning Batesia. He knew Batesia had something against her, so he tried to convince her that they shouldn't do this in the castle, warning that the great demon king would punish them. Batesia clenched her fist and pointed it at the stairs, silencing him. The woman was determined to eliminate her, even if it meant facing the wrath of the great demon king. Karos observed both of them, realizing he would lose if he went up against Batesia. At that moment, he stood there watching as Lilith and Batesia clashed with their unleashed powers. He thought to himself that no matter what, he was still the Demon King, and he clenched his fist, feeling it was truly a disgrace in this vast world. The luxurious hall of Lilith wrinkled her face in a mix of anger and confusion as she raised her gloved hand, demanding to know 
What is your status? In a dramatic flash, the furious woman exuded fierce authority as she stood tall in her striking red attire, symbolizing her power and status. As she raised her hand, she declared herself as the ruler who reigns over more than a tenth of the earthly realm. Introducing herself with a commanding presence, she stated that she was Batesia Confricia. Lilith was shocked as she uttered the name Batesia and realized that Batesia was one of the four total rulers among the 72 demon kings. Half the world is ruled by only four people. They are Capiera Bordos, the despair demon king, and the sadness Rubernea Malmus, the sadness and Sotra Cross, the joy and madness demon king, and finally Batesia Confracia, the demon king of screams and anger. Lilith still couldn't believe it because she never imagined seeing any of the four demon kings, and she even thought it was just her luck. Batesia unleashed her magic power around her, a storm of lightning swirling around. Batesia concluded that even if Lilith managed to escape before, this time she would still die when activating her magic power, the ground beneath her trembling and crumbling. The scene erupted with blinding blue light emanating from Batesia at the center of the chaos she was experiencing. Determined and screaming with all her might, her power was directed straight at Lilith, a power that destroyed everything in its path. Karos ran towards Lilith and warned her to be careful. He protected Lilith from the impending danger as the atmosphere filled with bright blue energy. Next, he filled the air with threatening light as the dazzling blue light subsided. Karos held Lilith protectively in his embrace, and the powerful magic that Batesia unleashed finally hit Karos's back. Batesia was surprised to see that Karos was still unharmed after receiving such a powerful attack that he couldn't even utter. Karos still held Lilith in his embrace as Lilith felt safe. She slowly opened her eyes and held Karos's shoulder, asking how he was doing. Batesia angrily asked Karos how he was still alive, pointing her finger at him. Karos was also confused and answered that he was curious why he wasn't hurt, knowing that Batesia unleashed a dominant power that should have killed him. Lilith, also confused, said that the cancellation of magic was a long-held ability of the great demon king, and she wondered why Karos suddenly appeared in the darkness for booting. The sound of hurried footsteps echoed through the corridor. A figure cloaked in darkness emitted an unpleasant aura as he ran through the hallway. The unknown man claimed to have heard a sound coming from the waiting room, so he went out to see. It turned out to be the great demon king. You seem to be having fun, he said with a wide grin, showing sharp, beast-like teeth and a mix of cheerfulness and sarcasm in his laughter. The scene shifted to the luxurious waiting room with a large round table in the middle. The great demon king now sat at the end of the table, with the man sitting across from him his gaze firm and serious, sharply contrasting with the great demon king. The great demon king finally broke the silence by asking, Why are you here to meet me? Karos then informed the great demon king that no matter how much he thought about it, he was sure there was a problem with his power because he drank wine while thinking that Karos was a crazy person, like what he expected. Karos then honestly said that he had defeated many demon kings before, but he had never seen a demon king whose power was Gachabatesia until now. He struggled to drink his drink, as he was shocked and couldn't believe what he had just heard from Gacha, which he thought about. His mind was shaken when he noticed Batesia's reaction pointing towards him as he coughed and struggled to recover from his shock. Caro said with a voice tinged with embarrassment and sadness, that was the typical response he would get when people found out his power was Gacha. He looked embarrassed and on the verge of tears as he continued to explain that his power was not good for calming fierce because getting a random box was too complicated and the possibilities were too uncertain. The great demon king was intrigued and leaned forward slightly. His interest was evident. So do you want to change your power? The great demon king asked Karos with a hint of hope in his voice and Karos replied firmly, yes, that's true. However, the demon king casually sipped his drink, leaving Karo shocked and questioning why such a powerful figure would act this way. The demon king crossed his legs and extended his hand, laughing as he explained that he was just bored and thought it would be fun to watch Karos play gacha.
Furious at this response, Karos stood up and exclaimed, How can you give me an answer like that? Just for fun? He was really angry, feeling like the great demon king was toying with him. Still smiling, the demon king raised a finger and suggested he could offer something else to Karos. Now curious and hopeful, Karos leaned forward, placing his hands on the table and asked, Something else? Batasia, sensing the tension, adopted a serious expression, his earlier shock replaced by concern. The great demon king shifted to a more serious tone, addressing Batesia directly by his title, the Screaming Demon King. Batesia was shocked and frightened as he stood, answering yes to the great demon king. Releasing his swirling power around him in black and purple hues, anger etched on his face, he reprimanded Batesia for embarrassing him in his own office by stating that he did not give his power for misuse like that. A strong energy enveloped Batesia, lifting him into the air like a tornado of fear. He apologized, his voice trembling with fear, as he struggled against the tightening grip, the demon king restraining the tornado around Batesia before beginning to choke him, stating that Batesia deserved to die for what he had done before. Batesia choked and begged for mercy. After a tense moment, the great demon king released her and declared that from now on she was stripped of her title as demon king. Batesia fell to the ground gasping for air, struggling to recover from choking. The great demon king then announced that her replacement would take over Batesia's position. From now on, you will be under Karos, the demon king of madness and greed, and follow his orders, said the great demon king, pointing her finger at Karos. Both Karos and Batesia were shocked to hear what the great demon king had just declared, appearing pleased with herself. The great demon king assumed that no one would complain from behind the closed waiting room door. Their responses could be heard as they screamed in disbelief at what Karos had snored. The next day he suddenly opened his eyes, jumped up, and spotted Batesia waiting for him in the corner, holding some yellow and green slime. The protagonist couldn't believe what had just happened and muttered that it was impossible. Batesia, panting and worried, heard him and pointed to his feet to explain what was going on. He kicked Karos and insisted that it couldn't be true. The woman was restless, unable to accept it, while Lilith stood behind her trying to stop her from kicking their master. She shouted that she couldn't accept it, and Lilith did her best to keep a furious Batesia calm, urging her to relax. Batesia then repeated that she just couldn't accept it. Karos started to think that Batesia still held a grudge against him. After Batesia finished his rampage, he just sat there, asking Karos how they could possibly live together. On the other hand, Lilith chimed in, saying they couldn't just undo the big decision made by the Demon King, chuckling awkwardly as Karos and Batesia glared at each other. To break the tension, Lilith suggested that Batesia should sort out his room first since they were in the Demon King's bedroom and office. As the secretary continued, she pointed out the bedroom and the connected room below, which was their attic with big windows used by the slime and succubus. Suddenly, a succubus appeared, shouting about the Demon King with excitement. She happily jumped onto Karo's, causing him to panic. The succubus managed to hug him tightly, her chest right in front of him, making him nearly stumble and groan like an old man. After that incident, he held on to his master's hair, but Karos let it go, looking like he had lost all his energy. Lilith stated that it seems the succubus finally woke up. The succubus smiled and said that she liked Karos because he was the demon king. Karos was a bit annoyed and asked about the behavior shown by the succubus, questioning why she suddenly acted like that. Lilith explained that all monsters from the Gacha obeyed the Demon King. As Lilith explained, the green and pink slime approached their master's feet. Karos realized why the succubus and slime were too attached to him. The green slime, which was almost reaching the stairs, was kicked by Karos while asking about their abilities. The succubus interrupted and enthusiastically shouted that there were none. She then started chewing on Karos's hair. The answer left the protagonist stunned as the succubus ate Karos's hair. Karos's scalp turned red from the pain. He almost cried and reminded the succubus that she shouldn't eat his hair. Karos remembered something and turned to Batesia. He grinned at Batesia and said, You said you have to obey me, isn't that right, Batesia? 
Batija was surprised when Karos remembered what she said. Karos stood as a silhouette against the starry sky under the light of the full moon, still in the same place after a week at the Demon King's castle. He was relaxing in his office with his feet up on his desk, looking at Lilith who was holding a red map and asking about Batija's activities. It's been quiet for a week now, Karos said, gazing at Lilith intently. Lilith reassured him, Don't worry about Batija. She's having fun playing with succubus and slime. I saw her happily bouncing around in the slime while the other slime held by the succubus flew around. Karos imagined Batija's joyful face saying that dealing with her would be troublesome. But surprisingly, they got along well because their mental ages were very similar. Karos then became serious. Crossing his arms and tapping his fingers on his arm, he asked Lilith about the current situation, reporting that they had set up double barriers so there was no risk of being discovered by the villagers for now, which was a relief. Karos said that there are currently 72 demon kings on the surface, but more than 30% have been defeated by human adventurers who are curious. These adventurers are driven by courage, greed, and curiosity, which have proven to be a strong force against the demon realm. Initially, Karos had to hide the demon king's castle very close but far from the human village. But now it's time to go out to grow our strength. We need to hunt monsters, Karos declared with a decisive moment. Karos straightened his body in his chair, placing one hand on the armrest while crossing his legs. He looked at Lilith and ordered her to tell him about the monster's habitat nearby, always efficient and ready. Lilith opened her red folder and provided detailed information that Karos was looking for, then mentioned that there were a total of four nearby, the closest being a goblin camp with around 300 goblins of all sizes and shapes, busy making simple weapons for cooking, lighting fires, and playing games. The camp had a rough wooden fence and a simple gate guarded by vigilant goblins. There were tents and small huts with a larger central tent indicating the leader's residence, Further away was the orc territory with about 500 orcs. The orc area was a tough camp in the hills, with a large bonfire burning where the orcs lived in strong huts made of wood and stone. There was also an ogre cave in the nearby forest, but only one ogre hibernating and the last one hidden inside. There was a mystery in the forest, but they had not identified it yet. Lilith looked down and asked Karos which one they should head to first. Karos sat in deep thought his hand on his chin, suddenly stood up with confidence that they would start with the goblin at Lilith's camp. He surprised the others with his sudden action, nodding and saying he understood. Then he remembered something and mentioned that there was also a mission if they successfully conquered the goblin habitat. Karos would receive two random boxes as a reward. With a confident face, Karos said that maybe he would get something good this time. Karos led the way through the tall grass field, with Batija following closely behind. Batija, a large warrior who once ruled the Tenth Continent, was now fighting goblins alongside her followers. As they walked through the tall grass, Batija complained, Just stay quiet and follow me. Karos replied, I will handle it, and I want you to not play around in front of Batija. Batija crossed her arms and declared that she would take care of it. She wanted Karos not to underestimate her. Karos let her speak and ignored her. Suddenly, a commotion broke out as a goblin ran ahead of Karos. Karos shouted at Batizia, ordering her not to run ahead, but the woman did not listen. After a few minutes, they arrived at the entrance to the goblin camp. She did not expect to see so many goblins hiding outside the gate in the tall bushes. They watched four goblins at the gate, one playing ball, two guards, and another one moving. The cart full of goods asked Batizia what they should do, but when he didn't get a response, he turned to Batizia. He was surprised when Batizia disappeared next to him. Turns out he stood bravely in front of the goblins. He shouted for them to listen. The goblins paid attention. Batizia introduced himself as the former demon king Batizia Confresh, and ordered them to bow down and pledge their loyalty to Karos and his hidden companion in the bushes. They couldn't believe what he was doing. The goblin camp gate opened and more goblins surrounded them. Karos thought this was bad, estimating at least 500 goblins would appear. A dangerous goblin in a robe and magic wand appeared behind Karos, causing him to panic and wonder what to do. 
To his surprise, the goblin bowed and promised their loyalty to Karos. Karos was shocked as all the goblins followed suit. Batesia, feeling all-powerful, laughed and said that bowing to them was a wise decision. Keros was confused, as he never thought gaining the loyalty of these monsters would be so easy in the goblin camp. A feast was prepared with delicious food, and Batesia raised her glass of wine, swirling it around. Keros, still puzzled, whispered to Batesia, commenting on how easily the goblins surrendered. The goblin offered Keros a bunch of fruits, urging him to enjoy the feeling. Batesia said it was only natural for them to submit to their power. The goblin leader offered to guide them through the village of Batesia. They agreed and followed. They also accepted a gift, but began to doubt something would happen. At that moment, they found that the goblin camp was quite large, with a size that they concluded should be considered a top-level monster. Keros noticed a large crack in the village wall as they wandered and asked the village chief about it nervously. The village chief explained that an ogre had gone on a rampage but was subdued. Karos felt that something was wrong, knowing that there was a huge power difference between goblins and ogres, and even 100 goblins were not enough to deal with one ogre. With a confused look on his face, he then called for Batesia and told her to throw away her drink, but then Batesia said that she had already finished it. They then saw three goblins ready to attack them. Karos, feeling anxious, shouted at Batesia to use her magic to wipe out the threat. Batesia stood there, full of confidence, trying to tap into her magical powers. But to her shock, nothing happened. She was left stunned, wondering why her magic had vanished. Next to her, Karos felt a wave of panic wash over him, his eyes widening in disbelief as he saw goblins charging toward them. In that moment, both Karos and Batesia were hit with an unusual fear, realizing they were in a potentially deadly situation. The air was filled with moisture in the dark and damp cave. The oppressive atmosphere made Bastia lose consciousness. But then, she woke up when a little water was poured on her head. She slowly opened her eyes and found herself tightly bound with thick, rough ropes. She panicked and tried to struggle against the restraints her voice echoing through the cave as she screamed to be released. Just as her voice began to fade, a familiar voice pierced the darkness and told her that it was futile. She saw Caro sitting right behind her with the same bindings. She was shocked to see the protagonist behind her. Caros concluded that she needed to understand what was happening when she stubbornly insisted on her own way. Batija's initial shock faded into a mix of guilt and frustration. She hung her head, and didn't say a word, knowing that it was truly her fault. Suddenly, the cave was destroyed. Illuminated by a large, roaring fire that came to life, the sudden brightness revealed a group of goblins advancing towards them, their eyes widening in anger, believing that she could easily destroy these goblins if she could still use her magic powers. That's the point, Batesia Karos said. It only confused the woman because the goblins thought so simply, so she believed it was impossible for the goblins to plan this. She was sure that another demon king was behind this because she was still processing her words, and then asked who would be the demon king Karos, then answered that there were also many suspects. Even if Lilith realized there was something miss, she was sure it was impossible for her to approach them alone. Batesia felt a wave of helplessness asking what they should do. Karos remained calm and said they could only watch and wait. Now the leader of the goblins was also inside the cave and proudly declared that he was the goblin who defeated the demon kings. Those words made Batesia's nerves and face turn red with anger. Wait and see, she shouted, her voice echoing in the cave. The explosion of her power made two goblins run in fear, their laughter turning into cries of terror. Batesia's eyes burning with fury as she watched the two goblins flee. One day, two days passed, and on the third day, Batesia was tired and leaned on Karos to seek support to break the silence. Batesia began to ask Karos why he did that to her when they were still students. Karos then asked her what she wanted to say. Why was she acting like she didn't understand? I'm talking about what happened at the academy. Why are you bothering me? Batesia said. Karos looked at her, his eyebrows furrowed, and he answered by telling the woman that he wasn't oppressing her. Batesia said it was her who spread that outrageous rumor. 
Batesia was accused of scratching her feet on the rough ground in the restless rumor. What rumor did Karos respond to? His confusion deepened, his expression becoming puzzled for a moment before he exploded. Don't act stupid, she shouted at Karos. Karos was startled by the intensity of her outburst. He said that she was the one spreading the rumor that she was the daughter of the Braille owner. Batesia's voice trembled with anger and betrayal as she spoke. Flashbacks of their academy days flashed through her mind. She remembered the beautiful moments she had with Karos. She thought at that time that they were friends, but then she felt betrayed for believing that Karos was the one spreading such rumors about her. You know how difficult that time was for me, you jerk, Batesia said angrily. Karos listened, his heart heavy with guilt. He didn't understand. He apologized to Batesia, but she said with conviction that this was the first time she heard it. Batesia stared at him, her anger still burning. What did she ask? Then a glimmer of realization crossed Karos's eyes. He understood now. He muttered a small smile, a revelation on his lips. The atmosphere inside the cave became tense as the goblins parted ways to make way for their leader. He approached with a menacing grin, ordering his minions to bring the demon king Karos along with them. The goblin minions stepped forward and quickly chained Karos Batesia. Unable to contain his confusion and anger, Karos asked, What is this? Why are you only calling him? The goblin leader answered, It is the will of the master. In the middle of the field, a small green house stood with its peculiar appearance, contrasting with the frightening blue light surrounding it. Tall trees loomed in the background, their branches swaying gently as Karos from another world stood in front of the curtain with two goblins standing beside him. The goblins then instructed him to welcome their master in the middle of the room, standing on a large platform holding a glowing crystal ball. It shimmered with magical purple light surrounded by an ancient magical aura, small lights like stars floating around it making it even more mysterious. Someone greeted, and it had been a while since a voice came from that crystal ball. Borkania Barsilov Karos replied while gazing at the crystal, which began to form an image of a woman with long, flowing purple hair, sitting gracefully on her throne. It turned out that this person was the treacherous and deceitful demon king. Borkania chuckled softly, wondering how he could know. Fighting was taken aback, resting her hand on her cheek, smiling as she looked into Karos's eyes. Karos's expression hardened as he asked Borkania what she wanted from him, convinced there was something she desired after all this time. Borkania casually replied that the only thing she wanted from Karos was to persuade her subordinate, Batesia, and send him to her. Her fangs glimmered as she spoke. Karos's eyes widened in confusion when he heard Batesia's name. The crystal's image shifted unexpectedly to reveal Batesia, sitting alone and bound in a dark cave. Borkenia continued, stating her goal was to eliminate Satra Cross. Batesia's expression turned wild at the mention of Satra, who was currently targeting her territory. Karos recalled that Satra Cross was one of the four strongest demon kings, Borkania believed it was impossible for her to face Satra Cross alone, but she was confident it would be enough if she teamed up with Beha, known for being strong and loyal. Karos then responded that Batesia might have lost his power as a demon king since he was now her subordinate. Karos was thinking that if he relied solely on Batesia's influence, his territory would eventually crumble, and his subordinates would lose faith in him and abandon him. The image of Batesia alone popped into his mind. Borkania asked him what was on his mind, and he reassured Karos that he wouldn't lose anything by doing this good deed. He promised to give him as many monsters as he wanted, especially when Batesia lost all his power. Borkania believed that once Batesia was out of the picture, he would just stay quiet and remain Karos's subordinate forever. Karos's smile faded into a chuckle. All right, Borkania, he said, his voice light and playful, but in an instant, his expression shifted, narrowing his eyes with intensity as he stared directly at Borkenia, rejecting the offer. Borkenia's face turned angry, his brows furrowing slightly. He asked Karos why he looked so confused and genuinely upset. Karos smiled and explained that he had certain principles he lived by, one of which was to protect his subordinates. He preferred to achieve things through his own strength 
rather than resorting to dishonorable actions. After hearing some nasty rumors about Batesia, he simply couldn't accept Borcania's suggestion. Borcania glared at him, feeling insulted by what he had just said. Karos realized that it was Borcania who spread rumors that Batesia was the daughter of the brothel owner and framed her as the culprit, causing him and Batesia to drift apart. That's enough about the past, he said with a hint of sarcasm. He understood her intentions and called her by her title, Demon King. The crystal ball suddenly released a chaotic display of black and purple energy swirling into a massive energy tornado. Borcania said Keros had chosen to die alone in this goblin cave. The goblin head called out and heard Borcania order him to kill Keros with a menacing appearance. The goblin head immediately responded, showing his unwavering loyalty and readiness to commit violence with a fierce low growl. He gripped the gleaming serrated sword threateningly in the dim light aiming it directly at Karos. Karos stood calmly in the midst of the increasing tension, meeting the goblin's gaze without an ounce of fear, a confident smile playing on his lips. As Karos prepared for the upcoming battle, he couldn't help but smile after hearing that the goblins from Borkinia were planning to eliminate him. He realized the woman had overlooked something important, his power as a demon king. Proudly, he showcased his green slime, tossing it around in various colors for the goblins to see. As he released the different hues, memories flooded back, reminding him that the slimes weren't entirely useless. He stroked his chin, gazing at the slime, and heard Lilith mention its ability to reduce volume. With that reassurance, he thought the green slime might fit into something like his pocket. He was about to test it out when all the slimes suddenly piled into his pocket at once. This unexpected behavior frustrated Karos, so he closed his eyes, massaged his temples, and tried to visualize the slimes inside. To his surprise, he saw the slime transform into a coin shape. Just as he finished reminiscing, he noticed the goblin was entranced by the green slime, even getting its feet tangled up. Karos couldn't help but laugh at the sight of the goblin being embraced by the slime, playfully asking if it enjoyed the taste of it. The goblin pleaded not to be ousted, and tears were seen from the goblin, as he also said that he would serve Karos as his master. While releasing him, Borcania heard the goblin pleading through the purple crystal ball. She cursed the goblin and angrily said that she would eliminate him. Karos heard the threat from another demon. The teacher interrupted and said that the relationship formed by the threat was fragile. The goblin was surprised by her statement while Borcania told Karos that he should not be foolish because there are still many goblins out there, despite the threat he received from the woman. He just smiled and asked her if her plan would still go on while thinking about his answer, provoking the woman, and he called the goblins and said that their master had ordered them to kill the demon king and the village chief. When the woman saw that the goblins did nothing, she repeated her command. The reflection of Karos's feet can be seen in the crystal ball, and he said that to use the goblin, one must understand their nature, because they only listen to representatives. That is the village chief. Karos claimed that the village chief is now on his side. He then asked the intrigued goblin if what he had just said was true. The goblin, surrounded by various colored slimes, hesitated to answer. Karos then ordered the tribal chief to take him to his lair, and the goblin easily agreed. However, the shaman already knew the answer the goblin had chosen Karos as his master. Therefore, he went mad and shattered the purple crystal ball on the other side in the cave, where Batesia was tied up and left alone. He began to wonder if Karos was dead. He remembered the words Karos had spoken earlier when they talked, stating that Karos apologized. But this was the first time he heard the rumor. Still, Batesia did not believe Karos and called him a liar. He remembered his childhood. In the village of Pantania, located in the desert, known for collecting trash, there was a young boy and an old man. The red-haired girl, born as the daughter of a lower-class prostitute, saw her mother getting beaten and crying in front of a man every day to earn money. They were among the poorest, sharing a piece of bread, yet happier than anyone else. As she grew older, her red hair grew longer, and she happily walked into their home calling for her mother.
but her tears turned to sorrow when she saw a group of armed men, her mother lying bruised and bloody. Her only family had just passed away. As she cried, a man called her, saying that Batija had a beautiful face and they should have fun before selling her. She left, surrounded by the men, and one of them said they agreed with their colleague's proposal. It all started when he discovered he had magical powers because he was angry at them. He unleashed his powers, turning all the houses into dead men. After that, he walked out of the house and wandered around the village. He was apprehended by two men in suits and many people surrounded them. The men said that they said his magic powers were so strong that someone with it only appeared once every ten years. The others pointed to the little girl they were carrying, a blonde-haired man and a white-haired woman. The man said that at that moment the little red-haired girl kneeling in front of them would be named Batizia Confricia. She would become their foster child and attend the academy. Her foster father reached for her hand. After being adopted, she started attending the academy but still felt alone. She overheard her classmates asking her if she was the adopted daughter of the Confricia family, which was why some girls wanted to be friends with her. She ignored them and just walked past their classes. She thought that having a prestigious family name would change everyone's attitude towards her, until she saw a boy in her class and thought that he didn't come from a prestigious family. Climbing alone, she then assumed that the boy might be in a similar situation as hers. The boy was none other than Karos. Batisia fought with Karos, which only made Karos angry and ask why she did it. Batisia smiled widely at him and answered that it was because he was ugly which is why Karos and she became true friends. Or when she thought that closeness shattered like glass, she heard that her classmates already knew she was from Pantania, and they also knew that she was the daughter of a low-class prostitute. From then on, she became an outcast because of what she heard. Her soul turned dark, as did the place. Someone held her hand, and it was a girl named Borcania. Borcania asked her if she was okay after Karos spread a rumor about her. When Batisia heard it, she didn't believe it because she never thought Karos would do it. She froze at that moment, approached Karos, and asked him if he really did it. But then Karos asked her what she meant, and at that moment she thought the woman was referring to the magical rampage incident. That's why she said, why ask now? Of course, I did it. After recalling the past with Batisia, she just smiled asking herself why she would reminisce about the past if Karos was still dead. She looked towards the cave path and angrily shouted, You're here, just kill me now, you scoundrel, when she thought there was a goblin staring at her. The woman was shocked and stumbled when she asked Karos how he managed to have the village head under his command. The protagonist simply told her that there was a way and then started. He untied Batija and at the same time explained that it was Borkania who spread rumors about him. The woman looked at him as if she heard it correctly. The source of the strange rumor wasn't me, it was him. Caro said once again, Batija, who seemed like her soul was leaving her body when she heard the rumor. She was speechless, and tears streamed from her eyes continuously while Karos was in front of her, reaching out his hand so Batija could reach it. He reassured the woman not to misunderstand, and only returned to the demon king's castle with her after they exited the cave. The view was clearer, and they spotted a bird flying around their house. Eventually, Karos made it home, feeling tired, so he plopped down in a chair, leaning back and declaring that this place was the best. Lilith brought him some tea, and he was happy to be back safe and sound. He glanced at the goblin and asked Karos if he planned to take the goblin as his subordinate. The protagonist replied that he would, especially since there were about 200 goblins around. Under the village head, he believed the goblins could be utilized as a special force if managed properly. Stretching out, he put his hands behind his head, yawned, and mentioned that the goblin would be staying with them at the Demon King's castle, so he instructed his secretary to look after the goblin. Lilith simply agreed with her master's words. When Karos was resting, he heard someone calling his name, and then he opened his left eye to see who that person was. Did he see Batesia, standing there unable to look straight at him and saying she wanted to talk to him? They both went to the rooftop and Karos asked what was going on. At the same time, he wondered what Batesia was planning to say. 
Right now, Batija was whispering the name of Borkenia Barcella. She honestly said that she considered Borkenia her true friend, but unfortunately she didn't. Suddenly, she knelt in front of Karos, apologizing for doubting him based on Borkenia's words blindly at the same time. When she knelt, the latter was surprised by her actions. Batesia, who was still kneeling in front of the demon king Karos, finally accepted that she was a faithful subordinate of Karos and vowed to follow all his orders. Batesia's actions towards the latter indicated that it was a ceremony and tradition to become a subordinate of the demon king. The fact that she promised her own desires meant she acknowledged Karos as her superior. Karos scratched his head and approved her promise, but part of him felt awkward thinking about it. This troubled Batesia, so she suddenly changed her attitude, and the woman was happy when Karos accepted her and answered by saying yes, as she wished. After chatting on the rooftop, they returned to the castle where everything was there, including the succubus she obtained from the box. As they gathered around, Batesia asked her master what she would do now, and she wanted to know if Karos had plans to attack another village after subduing the goblins. Karos took a sip of his tea while answering that there was something they needed to do first. Another thing that surprised Batesia. She asked what it was. Karos crossed his legs and turned, asking once again if she would really gain special abilities after completing Lilith's task. He said yes, but he wasn't sure if Karos would like it if yellow and green slime appeared at his master's feet and they stared sharply at their master. It can't be worse than it is now, just tell me. Karos said. Lilith pointed her finger into the air, and a dazzling light appeared along with purple dark magic. It seemed like Lilith was tapping into something like an interface. After that, a purple portal appeared right in front of them, and Lilith asked Karos to step inside. Karos was surprised when he realized that it was a subspace he entered into. Subspace and his two subordinates followed as they all walked in. Karos observed the colors were very tacky and wondered what the purpose of this place was. Initially, he assumed it was just storage. Lilith positioned her hand to point at something in front of them and instructed Karos to look there. A large screen appeared with the number 3222. Karos was puzzled by the number as it seemed unfamiliar to him. He asked what was inside while holding a box with 100 carvings at once. As the woman explained to him that he could buy the lottery box using the points displayed on the scoreboard, he held the box with carvings on top of it, believing it cost 100 points. He began to wonder because the rest of the Caroso, his secret, continued to explain that the greatness of the Demon King said that when something interesting happened, he would gradually fill the rest because Karos became upset and asked if that meant they could only buy 32 pieces at that time. His secretary said that he was right. The protagonist threw the box and wanted to buy all the boxes whenever the rest would be added again. He also said it after they bought all the boxes, they left the subspace together with the purchased boxes as they clutched the boxes. They all gathered around him, and Karos wanted to open them one by one. He held a box with curiosity and immediately opened it. When he looked inside, a bright yellow aura came out so bright that it emitted dazzling light, making him close his eyes as he peeked. He wondered what was inside the box. The box was very bright because there were beautiful crystals inside it. Baya then said it was the divine Orban Batasia, explaining that it was a dangerous mineral that could cause fatal wounds just by touching it. She also thought the mineral disappeared a thousand years ago, so she wondered why it was here now. Karos was surprised and asked her if it was valuable. The woman answered yes and added that it was much stronger than expected. After hearing that, Karos was happy and said they would seal it in the box for now while opening the rest. As they opened all the boxes, he asked his members to fill in what they had received from the boxes. There were old rusty swords and shields. Karos was upset with the items they had drawn. He saw a bat's eye holding a knife and thought that nothing was useful as he had hoped. He hoped there was nothing useful. He continued to ask how many boxes were left. His secretary held the box and declared that there were two boxes left. When they opened their boxes, they looked inside puzzled. Karos felt disgusted, 
saying that it smelled strange. Inside the box were rotten oranges. Karos was disappointed with all the boxes he bought. He squatted down and said that all the boxes were trash. But Succubus carefully looked inside the box and stated that it wasn't trash. She carefully held the necklace she got from the last box and examined it. Caro stared at her, asking what it was. After carefully examining the necklace, Succubus said that the necklace was for blocking magic. When Batesia heard it, she put it on and tried to acknowledge that she couldn't feel any magic at all. Karos was surprised and said that it was quite useful. Karos put his hand on his chin and began to think about the 32 box drawers, and he got a magical blocking necklace and a bon or. He also thought it might not be as bad a deal as he thought for now. He wanted to clean up the mess in his room while still thinking. Two girls behind him were arguing because Succubus wanted to try on the necklace and Batesia wouldn't allow it. Karos, the younger one, started cleaning, and he held a bag containing something he planned to throw away. But then Lilith stopped him and said to wait a moment, which confused him. Inside the bag was full of money, and Lilith asked if she could have it instead of throwing it away. Karos was confused because it was money from the human world, which means it cannot be used in their world. Before his secretary answered, he turned his face and said he wanted to buy some apples because it was apple season. Karos couldn't explain his reaction because of what he heard from his secretary. After that, he answered yes and allowed his secretary to buy apples. It was not a problem because he planned to visit the human village soon to find the first target. After a few days, Karos went to the human world hiding in the middle of the grass. Karos was confused because both Batesia followed him again. Batesia asked what the powerless demon king could do alone, so it was better for them to accompany him in case something happened without canceling the magic left by Karen and only allowing them to follow him while saying that he understood the woman's attention attracted the succubus, and he asked the younger one why she also came. The younger one was surprised and explained that she did not come. She had not held a coming-of-age ceremony yet, so she did not have any magic. She proudly pointed her horn and said that she could hide it along with her wings. Caro said nothing, just warned them not to cause trouble. The village was in front of one of them as they hid in the tall grass. Their subordinate acknowledged Karos's warning by saying yes. As they were still hiding in the grass, Karos gave his subordinate a cloth and ordered them to wear it. Batesia watched closely while the succubus felt ticklish. Accepting it, Karos put on a hoodie as they were getting close to the village. They headed towards the village path as they walked near the city gate. Karos noticed the succubus and asked the younger one if she couldn't do something about that thing. The younger girl's head was emotionless, and she took off her hoodie as the green slime lay on her head. She said she wanted to, but the older sister slime felt suffocated and wanted the green slime to come out. The green slime was stubborn and angry. Karos heard it all and saw everything, and he was surprised when the slime could speak. Karos then approached the succubus and put back on his hoodie. Batesia then realized that Karos and the one he could call could communicate with each other. The succubus frowned at Karos and immediately changed. She pointed and instructed her leader and Batesia that they had arrived at the village. As they observed, they were entertained by how big the city was before they could finally enter. A man in full warrior attire stopped them and said that the place was Barak territory and wanted to know what their business was with Karos village. They then explained that they were just adventurers seeking and traveling for a long time and tired. He added that after a long journey, they wanted to rest in their village for a while. The village guard wanted to see their IDs before Karos could react. Batesia quickly went to the protagonist's side and said that it was their ID, but the woman was cunning and used her powers to hypnotize the village guard. Right after what she did, the guard welcomed them, and he just smiled as they passed the village guard. They walked into the village, and Karos realized that it wasn't as easy as it seemed when they walked and lingered in the town they giggled at how vast the village was. Some people could be seen displaying their Batesia petal products. Batesia couldn't stay still. She saw everything because it was beautiful. Karos, who was beautiful, noticed that the lives of the people living in the village didn't seem bad, but their public sentiment didn't seem good when they heard it. Karos stopped and looked towards her master, 
asking how he could know the best types of vegetables to fill each vegetable container. Caro said that the food store was busy, and it was clear that they had no problem in making a living. They both looked in the same direction, spotting a boy buying some food. While the kids seemed happy, the adults appeared gloomy, which said a lot as they continued walking. Batizia turned her head away, agreeing with the last point as they lingered on the topic of the succubus. Suddenly, a boy who looked about their age bumped into the succubus. They both huffed at what just happened. The boy quickly apologized to the succubus, but Bezia got protective over her younger sibling and snapped at him. She asked how he dared to bump into the succubus. Karos was taken aback and shielded the woman with his body, saying she shouldn't take it out on the kid. He wanted to let it go, but Batizia was shocked by his reaction. Meanwhile, the boy was trembling in fear of the woman. Caro still blocked her, whispering to the boy that he was free to leave. The boy looked down, while the woman was annoyed with her master, Batizia, who was getting angrier and nudged him. Caros asked why he let the boy go. Karen just told him that he needed to do it while holding back her anger. Succubus suddenly ran and stopped them in their argument. She enthusiastically pointed to the fruit stand. When they looked at the fruit stand in the distance, there was a man who looked like a fruit seller before they walked near him, Karos reminded them both. Previously that they had to shut up no matter what he said above the fruit stand, Succubus happily agreed while Batesia still frowned, retorted and asked if he was still a child, then insulted Karos. They kept walking near the fruit stand when they arrived. Karos then noticed that the apples were ripe. The seller admitted it and said that he paid great attention to the fruits. He also said that this year's harvest was very good, so the apples were delicious. When Karos felt happy with the seller, he continued and whispered to ask about the village atmosphere. Because strangely, he felt uncomfortable when the seller held the apples they bought, he looked around and whispered his answer. He said that it was because their master in the village Karos was confused and asked about their master. The old man answered that a new master recently took over their territory. It seems their master has a red-haired man, and he continued that the reviews were not good because they knew how arrogant the nobles were. He also whispered that there was a rumor that their master imprisoned a woman who originally lived in the Karos castle, was surprised by what he heard from the seller, and why the seller handed over the shopping bag containing the apples they bought in it. He answered that he didn't know because they never got along to begin with. When Karos reached for the shopping bag from the old man, he stated that it was an interesting story and thought it might just be a rumor but worth investigating. He then turned to the succubus and asked the younger one to give him the money bag. But the younger girl was shocked and said she didn't have any money. They pulled the youngest one by the collar of her shirt and angrily asked what the succubus had said. The younger EXP explained that she didn't have it and showed that the child who bumped into her earlier took the money. Their money bags, including the sellers, all looked at each other. On the other hand, the boy who bumped into the succubus kept looking back and walked down the street full of gangsters and all bald men holding tools. The man sitting asked the boy if he had returned and what the hall was like today. The boy went to the bald man while holding a bag. The bald man took it and looked inside, full of money. He praised the boy for stealing so much money, and they called the boy number three, celebrated by the gangsters for his wealth. On the other hand, the boy thought he was lucky because he wouldn't be beaten that day, but the other gangsters grabbed the boy's hair and ordered him to go back to the people where he got a lot of money. The boy felt pain in his hair and asked the gangster what it was, then the gangsters explained that the travelers where the boy stole the money might be rich travelers, so they wanted the boy to go back and beg or cry and do whatever he could to get more money. The big man clenched his fist, intending to punch the boy. The boy closed his eyes in fear, thinking he would be beaten up roughly again. Suddenly, someone said that those people didn't use good stuff based on his smell. The evil people then looked towards the person who suddenly came asking who he was and it turned out to be Batasia, telling them that they would meet again. Of course, she was with Karos and Succubus, standing behind the kneeling boy. One of the gangsters approached the woman and found that Batasia possessed a rare beauty. 
He said that Batesia was brave enough to come to their study room to fight. The woman didn't say anything. She just grabbed the gangster's face and unleashed her dark, purple lightning power. She then aimed at the gangster and let him fly. The gangster fell to the ground unconscious. The woman patted the man's body and said he was too greedy and foolish. She demanded to get back the money stolen by the boy. The boy who witnessed everything was shocked. Behind him, many gangsters wanted to attack the woman. Another man entered, covered in tattoos. He cursed and asked what kind of woman she was and why they were interfering in other people's business. He also said they wouldn't give up the money without a fight. He then ordered his other friends, and all three of them were surrounded by everyone. As the gangsters on the street all held a piece of metal B, they wondered to themselves how long they had to endure this kind of fight. Karos replied that he didn't think they should do it, and the woman lazily asked him if he was sure about what he said. The succubus watched as the green slime filled with anger, while the youngest one stood against the wall seemed to signal the slime to attack some gangsters who were cornering their boss in Batesia. Both slimes stuck to the enemy's faces, and the bad guys felt uncomfortable with the sticky slime as they watched the third one. Someone said this was his chance to show his skills. The succubus guessed that the slime brothers were getting frustrated. The slime bit into his money pouch, and Batesia noticed that the slimy creature had found money. A young boy looked terrified and seemed ready to run away from the scene, but Karos grabbed his shoulder and asked where he thought he was going. The boy froze and screamed for help. Karos stood in front of the frightened boy and asked if he knew anyone in the village. The boy stuttered and then fell silent, humming Christmas songs before suddenly asking about his parents, wondering if he was an orphan. He was indeed searching for his family, and the boy confirmed he was an orphan. Karos then approached Batesia and instructed her to take care of the boy and bring him to his castle. The woman was shocked and replied that they wouldn't just get rid of the boy. Karos reassured the boy that they would provide him with plenty of food and a warm place to sleep, which made the boy happy. He asked if the boy believed him, and Karos had a few conditions for him, saying they needed to make a deal. He then asked if the boy would accept his offer and reached for his hand. The boy agreed and took his hand, and as they sealed the deal, the dark power of the Demon King was unleashed, causing the boy to lose consciousness. After receiving the urgent call, the village chief hurriedly took the child to the Demon King's castle. He also brought the bad news that the ogres had awakened and started devouring everything, desperately seeking help from Karos. Tears streamed down his face as he begged for assistance while Batesia and Karos roamed in the dense forest. The heart of the forest was truly dreadful. Why did the ogres have to awaken again? Batesia complained about his frustration clearly visible as he walked with a staff, stopped complaining and told him to release Karos bluntly. Then suddenly asked Karos why he let the boy live, his face showing confusion. Karos turned to him and said that the demon king had tried to take over the human village by force, but for him, he wanted to take a different route, a different route. Batesia asked. Karos continued to say that he would sow discord from within the empire and slowly grow larger. He was sure that it was not always external enemies who killed giants, but the system itself. As he spoke, he created an illusion of the empire in his hands to carry out his plan. He needed some humans by his side. Batesia was still confused, asking if he needed to do it because he had the option to destroy humans by force. After chatting for a few minutes, they reached the ogre cave, surrounded by thick foliage, ready to face whatever threats lurked inside. Meanwhile, a succubus was casually flying over the peaceful human village, eyeing some shiny accessories and getting ready to swoop down. She got distracted by a glimmer coming from a castle window and, curious, floated closer. But it was just a bar. I'll take that jewelry to the Demon King. He'll love it, she thought. Peeking through the bars, she spotted a woman with white hair. They both froze, surprised to see each other. The white-haired woman asked who she was, and the succubus, equally shocked, wondered if she could actually see her. The woman met her gaze and replied, Yes. The succubus muttered to herself that she shouldn't be visible. 
The white-haired lady said she didn't know how she ended up there, but it wasn't safe for someone so young to be around. She urged the succubus to leave quickly before anyone noticed her, adding to go as far as she could. Then, she suddenly walked away. Confused, the succubus mumbled about the strange human before remembering her mission and stating she was there to retrieve something. In the castle of the demon king Lilith, while eating an apple, asked Karos if he had taken over the ogre Batasia cave. Leaning on the table, listening to Karos sipping his tea, he replied that it took less than three minutes to capture Ogre, adding that there was no problem, and he felt very proud considering their plan. I asked when they planned to return to the human village. Caro stood up, looking at the map of the human village. He said he needed to do something about it, pointing to the map as he said they should let them destroy themselves without their interference. How Lilith asked Karos to tear up the map, saying that it would happen by organizing an internal rebellion led by the nobles. Lilith's eyes widened as she realized that it would be considered a territorial battle rather than a rebellion. Bingo Caros made sure with joy that he understood. He rubbed his chin while thinking, but where could they find a noble to join them? Batesia remembered something. He remembered the merchant telling them about a young woman named Juanita. If she was as rumored, they might get help. Karos nudged Batesia, teasing and saying he saw all the help he needed on Batesia's face. Batesia remained silent, his annoyance increasing. Karos then ordered him to wake up. They would ask him something. They shifted their attention to the unconscious boy, ready to interrogate him for further information. In the car office, he sat facing the man kneeling in front of him. Karos asked the boy for his name, and the boy answered that his name was Jacob, smiling. Karos then asked Jacob if he knew anything about the former lord's daughter in their village. According to Jacob, the woman's name was Irina Astria, and she might be in her twenties. She was a beautiful woman with silver hair and golden eyes. Jacob remembered how she was greatly liked by everyone because she cared for the poor villagers and was a rare type of noblewoman. Suddenly, Jacob stopped talking when he remembered something the succubus had said about having silver hair and golden eyes, and he thought he knew who she was. The scene shifted to a cell where Arena sat with food on the floor, and a guard nearby asked her if she was okay as she approached the meal. Irina replied that she was fine, and that this wasn't the first time she had eaten like this, adding that the Lord's command is one she must follow. The guard knelt down, bowing his head, and wondered how things had ended up like this while holding the door to Irina's cell. Irina, chained and holding the bread, mentioned that she was the eldest daughter with no claim to succession and would be sold. So it made sense for the guard to look at her and say that her sister was currently causing a scene, drinking free alcohol in the village during a fictional holiday feast. Irina heard the guard saying it would be better if she had become the ruler, not her brother. Irina stood up, turned her back to the guard, and asked him to leave, warning that she wouldn't be safe if he stayed too long. The guard followed her advice and began to leave.